Hi everybody, I'm Alexis Perry and I go to Washita Baptist University. In this video, we will be explaining how to apply the rules of gene annotation. There's a very similar video to this one explaining the rules, but this one will be giving you specific examples on how to apply the rules. All right, rule number one. On this FamRater genomic map right here, all genes located underneath this ruler are reverse genes. So gene 71 is in fact a reverse gene and it completely overlaps with genes 70 and 72. Um, since only one strain of DNA can code for a gene at a time, gene 71 will end up being deleted. If you look below each gene in the parentheses, this number indicates how many specific genes are in its fam. So there are only two other phages within this fam that call a similar sequence. This number is quite small, as you can see from other genes, compared to gene 60 that has 280, or gene 61 with 825. So since this number is pretty small, it's just more evidence in why gene 71 should be deleted. Rules two and three talk about overlaps and gaps and how they're usually pretty small. In this column right here, overlaps are the ones with the negative sign and gaps are the ones with the positive sign. The general rule of thumb is that the largest acceptable gap or overlap is 30 base pairs because in nature, genes are very tightly packed so there's not a whole lot of room for gaps. So this negative 181 uh, gap is, um, overlap is very large and this 110 gap is also very large. This negative for overlap right here is the best option out of all of these choices and it provides even stronger evidence in why we should choose this start of the protein. Rule number four helps us choose a start through different databases like Glimmer and GeneMark. On this screenshot of Pecan, Glimmer and GeneMark are both calling the potential start for this gene at 3,600. Sometimes they'll disagree with each other and sometimes they'll agree with each other like in this situation. And then on the left, this screenshot is GeneMark. The different, um, all of these black numbers right here are different potential starts. And then the red uh, dotted lines and black lines are the coding potential. As you can see, the 3600 start right here has very high coding potential with these high red and black peaks. And with high coding potential, it is even more evidence in why we should choose that start for that gene. Rule number 12 is very similar to rule number 4, as it helps us choose the best start for each gene. But now we are looking at the gap, z-score, and starter rater. As we talked about before, we are looking for the smallest gap. So neg the negative 14 overlap over here is the best option. And for z-score in this column, we are looking for the number closest to 2, whether it's a little bit under, a little bit over. So in this example, the 1.829 would be the best option compared to the 1.006 option because it's the closest to two out of all of these. And for Starterator, here's a screenshot of Starterator. In this example, we're looking at the gene SOB um, and the star of 3,600 has the most manual annotations compared to all the other starts. The start with the most manual annotations has the best evidence in why it should be chosen compared to the other starts. With rule number five, we are looking at similarities between genes. Gene 38 right here is an example of an ORFAM. We can tell it's an ORFAM because it's white and has the number one within the parentheses right here. An ORFAM means that it is the only gene within its entire fam. So that means that starterator and other blasts will likely be uninformative um, at annotating this specific gene. But even though there's a lack of information on this gene, it doesn't mean it should be deleted, but it is very strong evidence in why it should be deleted. Rule number six talks about when there's a large gap of a, over 120 base pairs, it should be carefully looked at for a missing gene. In this example, there is a 355 base pair gap between the gene 68 and 69. And after we look back at it, there actually was a missing gene between the two. So this signifies that when there's a large gap over 120, that you should look back at it because there could be a gene that was not identified by Glimmer or a gene mark. Rule number seven explains that when there is a directional change in how the gene is being transcribed, there needs to be at least a 50 base pair gap in the directional change. So on this FamRater map right here in this example, the gene is being transcribed forward and then it goes to reverse and then it goes to forward again. And there is indeed a 50 base pair gap in both of these directional changes right here. And if we look at this pecan 
Um, it is the same exact place. This 47 to 48, where it switches from reverse to forward, there is indeed a 50 base pair gap between the two genes right here. Gene 8 tells us that genes are generally about 120 base pairs or longer. On Bacon, we can find the length of each gene in this column right here. As you can see, all of these options are below the average length of 120 base pairs longs, which means that we should be considering deleting it. But if we look at Bacon, we can actually see that it is very normal for this abnormal short length to um, exist because 189 other phages within this fam also call this short gene. But if this number were to be smaller, like one or two, then we should probably consider deleting this gene. Rule number nine says that genes are typically grouped in the way that they are transcribed. On Pecan, we can see how uh, genes 27 through 38 are all in the forward direction, and then genes 39 through 45 are all in the reverse direction. It is very common to see genes grouped together like this. It is less common to see them switching from forward to reverse constantly. Rules 10 and 11 talk about star and stop codons. On this screenshot of gene mark right here, within this purple circle, this uptick signifies a star codon, which starts the coding for this gene right here. Star codons are made up of three nucleotides, and the star codon of TTG only happens 10% of the time, so there might be databases that don't call the star TTG, but it actually might be the star in some situations. And then in this blue circle, this downtick signifies a stop codon, which will stop the coding of this gene. Rule 14 talks about the gene's function and how to find it through different databases like HHPred, PhagesDB, NCBI, BLAST, and Sydney. These databases help find the gene's function, whether it's known or unknown. And the databases can sometimes disagree with each other or agree with each other, like in this situation. Phages DB Blast, HH Pred, and NCBI Blast all call the function of this gene a major capsid protein here, here, and here. So the evidence of this gene being a major capsid protein is very high. And then the database Sydney is a rule book for gene function. It helps tell us where and when this function should be used. So after you find or believe that, um, that you found the function of the gene, you need to go um, look back on Sydney to make sure it's correct. And lastly, Rule 15 stresses the importance and why we need to revise our annotations. As you annotate, make sure to go back and double check your work because it is very easy to make mistakes. Additionally, as you annotate, the functions of later genes can actually affect the functions of previous genes. So going back and double checking is a great way to fix any annotations that could be mistakes. Thank you so much for watching guys. I hope this video gave you more insight and a better perspective about the rules for gene annotation. Good luck with all your annotating. <laughs>